Hello everyone, this is recording number eight for Early Stoic Philosophy, a class on Stoic logic, physics, and ethics. And today I want to talk about the Stoic theory of action. So we are moving on from Stoic logic to action theory. And I want us to begin to think through the Stoic views by seeing how they fare in a debate with the skeptics. The Stoics raise a famous objection against the skeptics who claim that they can be active without assent to impressions. And the challenge is called the apraxia challenge. Literally, that means the inactivity challenge. The challenge that without assent to impressions, you cannot act. And that challenge goes to the heart of Stoic theory. Namely, that according to the Stoics, we set ourselves in motion as human agents by assenting to a certain kind of impression, and that kind of assent generates or is an impulse for action. And that is what we want to understand. Now, here are two versions of the apraxia challenge which I've distinguished in earlier work and which will help us think things through. One can be called the animal charge. And that is that the skeptic by not assenting to impressions moves through the world like an animal, not like a rational being. Here the thought is that without assent, maybe the skeptic is somehow guided by impressions and some kind of response to these impressions. But what is lacking is the distinctively rational act of assenting to an impression. And hence the skeptic, according to the Stoics, only moves as an animal would. The second version of the apraxia challenge that I want to mention can be called paralysis charge. And that is the thought that if you're not assenting to a particular impression that represents a choice scenario, you may end up being paralyzed because let's say that you are in a situation where several courses of action are possible. So you can represent to yourself several choices. And if you're not then reasoning about what to do, assenting to one while not assenting to the others or rejecting the others, then presumably you would be stuck not doing anything. You would be paralyzed. So that is another version of the inactivity charge or apraxia charge. Now, in order to assess this, let's look a little bit at how the Stoics describe movement. They offer a scale of nature that proceeds by describing different kinds of movements to different parts of the universe. We are one kind of part of the universe. Animals are another kind of part of the universe. Animals, according to the Stoics, indeed have impression. So they have representations. They are impacted by sense perception and so on and so forth. And they have, because that is a kind of impact, impulse. Their impressions, let's say the impression, this is some food, produces an impulse, let's say in this example, maybe the impulse to go after the food. And then compared to animals, human beings have not only impression and impulse, but they have also ascent. But the tricky thing and the interesting thing is that ascent is not as it were added as if the sequence that we already saw in animals was stable. So you have impression, you have impressions causing some kind of impulse. And then in addition, there is a sense. Rather, the stoic proposal is that rationality as it were changes everything. Given that the human mind is a reason for us when we have impressions, impressions are as it were an invitation to assess them. An impression represents the world as being a certain way, 
And then as a reasoner, you either accept that or you reject that or you suspend judgment on it. So for us, impressions do not immediately cause impulse in a context that is concerned with you know, something that one could be doing, but rather they are a kind of push towards rationally accepting the impression or rejecting it or suspending judgment on it. That is how the Stoics compare animal movement and human movement and human movement is action. Now, the academic skeptics seem to exploit precisely the kind of perhaps ambiguity here, which consists in, on the one hand, it seems that for the Stoics, a combination of impression and impulse can exist without assent. And on the other hand, it seems that in human beings, impression and impulse cannot exist without assent because really assent is assent to impressions and only that then generates in us impulse. And the academic skeptics kind of go with the first picture. That is reported in a text by Plutarch that we already studied when we looked at this claim that according to the Stoics, there are three movements of the mind, impression, impulse, ascent. And here you see that sequence, which as it were suggests that you first have impression, then you have impulse, and then somehow ascent seems to be the third thing. So working with that kind of intuition, the skeptics make the following argument, and they use a really everyday example. The example is that someone wants to leave a room. Now, the skeptics argue that they have an impression, let's say, of there's the door. And that impression generates the impulse to move towards the door and leave the room through the door, rather than running into a wall. As you know, a critic of the skeptics might say, if you're not assenting to impressions, then that means you're not even accepting as true that there is a wall and there is a door. So you end up running into walls if you want to leave a room. But the skeptics say, no, we don't, because the impression that there's the door can generate the impulse to walk towards the door, to walk through the door, and that's just fine. And we can act and be active without the sin. And in response to that, the Stoics can raise what I call the animal charge. They can say, well, but then you describe yourself as if you were an animal. Because now you are saying that the way in which you move through the world is the way in which animals move through the world with just impression and impulse. But actually, that is not really open to you, that option, because you and I are having this discussion and you are a rational being. That is evident, even in the kind of simple fact of us having this discussion. And since you are a reasoner, it is simply not going to be the case that in your mind, impression and impulse function as they do in an animal mind, rather in a human mind, which is rational. Impressions, as it were, invite you to assess them, reason, according to the Stoics, judges, and passes judgment on impressions. And that is how your mind works, academic skeptic, whether you like it or not. So this kind of dispute then becomes even more precise in a way if we pursue it further with respect to the paralysis charge, because now the Stoic could also say, and suppose there are two doors in the room. They are right next to each other. You look at one door, you look at the other door. Are you telling me that you are just, by having one of these impressions kind of led to walk through this door rather than that door? That seems implausible. Rather, you would seem to need a reason to walk through this door or that door. And that is just how it works in the human mind, that human minds assess impressions. And in particular, if there are several choices, then this kind of assessment helps them decide between options so that they do one thing rather than another. But you, if you don't do that, if you are not going to assess 
choice scenarios, then in fact, you're going to be paralyzed because you might be kind of attracted by this door and that door. And then what are you going to do? Maybe nothing. So in this kind of discussion, the Stoics seem to have pretty strong arguments. But I want to end the recording with a kind of really deep and fundamental question. Early Peronian thinkers not only raised the kind of argument that we saw now ascribed to academic skepticism, but they genuinely called into question the basic assumption that we are rational agents. And that is the most fundamental assumption that the Stoics make, that we are reasoners who engage as reasoners with several choice scenarios. And early Peronian thinkers suggest that maybe that is just an illusion and maybe, in fact, we operate much more like animals moving through the world in ways that maybe involve the illusion of reasoning, but don't genuinely involve a kind of reasoned assessment of choice scenarios. And I want to sort of leave you with the question of how to think about the most basic premise here, that human action is fundamentally rational action. 